JN4 Canuck goes back to the First World War, 1917, when thousands of young Canadian volunteers learned to fly in this perky little aircraft. In just 21 months, we built more than 1,200 Canucks, a remarkable achievement. Experience our aviation heritage. Visit Canada's new National Aviation Museum in Ottawa. Michelle Stonkis. 401 Sunset can be seen here on Cable 11 every Tuesday and Thursday at 6. This show is a creation of the students, staff, and faculty at the University of Windsor. Tonight we are going to expose you to different forms of expression occurring around the community. John Carrington will introduce us to our own Leslie Lovett Doust, who is a member of a board to which people can voice their environmental concerns. And there are various other forms of expression within the community. Dave Hodge will report on an alternative expression in the local media, and Sherry Tamsu will tell us how you can express yourself on a limited budget. But first, Wayne Tusinot will show us how dance and visual arts can be combined in a unique and effective form of artistic expression. Wayne takes us behind the scenes of a recent collaboration between the Gina Laurie Riley dance troupe and the visual arts students at the University of Windsor. first year Art Fundamentals 3D Multimedia class. Recently, these students were involved in a dance production by Gina Laurie Riley entitled View from the Periphery. Sue and David, welcome to the show. Thank Thanks, you. Um, first of all, could you tell me how you got involved with this dance production? Our class has a lot to do with performance. So instead of putting on our own performance, we incorporated our class project with Gina Laurie Riley's dance troupe, and it turned out really well. Everyone interacted very nicely. I understand uh, your teacher of the class uh, built the set. Wayne Tuzano and Joe DeAngelis, two professors from the visual arts, put it together. It was excellent with just several doors with the illusion of uh, bar shadows and things. It was great. Mm -hmm. Could you tell me if you had any expectations about the performance or if you have it, had any fears at all about working with a professional troupe? I think everything went as expected. Uh, everyone interacted well with the dancers and everything went smoothly that way. There weren't many fears on the part of our class, except uh, maybe the males were afraid that they would be made fun of. <laughs> so there's only two of our male students in the performance. The males didn't like to dance? No. <laughs> But the ones that did were cooperative. Well, I, I didn't know what we were going into initially. I knew we were going to be introduced to a, a professional dance troupe. Mm -hmm. I know all the guys were saying, oh, I'm not going to dance. She can't make me dance. <laughs> <laughs> Can you tell me, I understand that you didn't have very much time to put this whole production together, uh, and it required a great deal of commitment on your part. Uh, can you tell me about the time that was involved in it? Well, we were only um, involved in it two weeks before the actual performance. We met on Tuesdays and Thursdays, and then for the dress rehearsal and the performance itself. So it was really rushed into, but it was it turned out very well. There weren't any mistakes, and the dan the whole dance itself was put together within a month. It must have been extremely hard for you to learn all those things in such a short time. It was quite complicated in some parts, but it was we could all handle it. Dave, could you tell me um, what? Did you have any favorite parts about the performance? A lot. Oh, no. uh, there's one part, one of the dancers, Lori, it's towards the end of the production where she's shaking almost as if she's going into a seizure. And I just thought that, that took incredible control on her part. So the dancers were uh, 
extremely involved in what they were doing. Yeah, very, very much so. Okay, and Dave, could you also tell me, did you expect to be doing this in an art class? No, <laughs> not at all. Is this, does this vary from what you might think would be a traditional art class, if there is such a thing? <laughs> it's, it's different in that because it's multimedia, we're being exposed to video cameras and the performance art aspect, which is, I think it's great. It's good to be involved in something like that in the arts community rather than just reading about it or watching it on TV. I just wanted to say that my favorite part of the performance was uh, when one of the male dancers was banging on the door and uh, there was a female dancer behind the door and they managed to move the door completely around in a full circle. How was that set up? And that, that was right towards the end of the performance, right. I believe. Yeah, that, that was incredible too, to watch from backstage. That was, uh, the female dancer was actually taking very tiny steps, but it looks like, I think from the stage, it looks like the male dancer is pushing the door and it's just sort of dragging away. For the most part, I thought that it uh, really didn't look like anybody was making a lot of movements there. It was so subtle that you couldn't really even I see it. I know what's incredible. It's like she, she was just there. Then we realized she was taking these little tiny steps. <laughs>
available. Whenever we get abundance of something, then we put it on sale. They reduce the price on, you know, on about half price. So that way it encourages the people to come in and buy it rather than us selling it as rags. Most of all, I think, um, is that it's a form of, of recycling what we do. And I think it's very useful to society. Um, really, most of our stuff is not thrown out. And uh, what we can't sell in these stores, well, we sell as rags to the factory. So, you know, it makes you feel good that you're doing, contributing to, <laughs> to for recycling, some form of recycling. Do you find many students shopping here? Yes, I do, mostly on the weekend, and I really enjoy them a lot. They're really, really nice to have around. Uh, they give, they, they know their prices, and they're very good shoppers. I think it might be because it's, it's, the prices are reasonable for them because most of them are on strict budgets, you know, and I think uh, they benefit a lot by shopping. And then I think they enjoy these uh, the, the vintage look, and we have a lot of this here. Um, the Goodwill store in St. Vincent de Paul down the street, and I found some fantastic stuff there. I've bought a lot of uh, suede coats, and I cut, I cut the suede coats up, and I take them and I put them in panels in the sides of jeans. And actually, the, I got this sweater out of St. Vincent de Paul as well. Jeans, no matter how old, they, you can usually still wear them as long as the uh, butt's not out. Well, the same reason they'd benefit anyone else. Students aren't, aren't earning it. Most of them aren't earning a, a very good income, especially full-time students. So it enables them to get clothes at a discount price. And if you wash them, I hate to tell you, they're clean. <laughs> so it's not so bad. Um, well, my mom shops at Goodwill a lot, so I guess I get I get more stuff from there because she brings it home, and I go there myself. You, s you see a lot of good stuff used, and you can recycle and everything. It's a good idea. It's really cheap. You know. Clothes mostly. You can find the most interesting out-of-style clothing. Uh, I bought two weeks ago. I bought. Um, sort of a light brown colored cable knit sweater that was in perfect shape. Wow, plaid polyester shorts. I have this blue shirt, it's got these really long collars. I like it, I think it's really neat. It's like polyester. Uh, I got a pair of plaid pants once. Plaid pants for, um, I think, $9. Uh, I don't wear them that often, but I love them.
Such forms of media expressing alternative and enlightening views can be found here in Windsor. Dave Hodge looked into some of these particular papers and discovered unique forms of expression finding a readership throughout the area. It's 
quite up to date. It's not like there something happens three weeks ago and you find it in that paper two days later, like a few weeks later or whatever. It's uh, you know, it's got a good amount of information. Keeps you go keeps you up to date on things that are happening in the school. It's all right. I like their their new feature, the question. Um, sometimes you get really funny answers that you have to put in. I mean, the, last week's question being on um, whether or not the pill should be included in the drug plan, and someone said, yeah, I think it should be distributed in all the women's bathrooms. I mean, some people are joking, but some people really have those opinions. And I mean, that's, that's indicative of our campus. With the increased readership and the expansion of both the Lance and the Reader, the students at the University and the people of Windsor will have the satisfaction of knowing that an alternative media source does exist in Windsor. For 401 Sunset, I'm Dave Hodge. Perhaps we should take advantage of these alternative newspapers before Conrad Black buys them all out. Windsor is better served with additional forms of expression. People need the media and other organizations to reflect the best interests of society. The Environmental Appeal Board is such an organization, and John Carrington welcomes one of its newest members. Leslie Lovett Doust is a member of the Faculty of Biological Sciences and an active environmentalist. Tonight, she gets to tell her story. Now, you've been at the University of Windsor a few years, but in Windsor longer than that. Tell us about that. Right, well, I've been here since 88. Uh, I've been an adjunct in the biology department for a while, and uh, then became a regular faculty member about a year and a half ago. You were with the International Joint Commission before you came here to the university. That's right, yes. We worked on um, Great Lakes issues, uh, sort of binational U.S.-Canadian government interactions. You have such a varied background, and we want to talk about a number of things in this mm -hmm. five minutes. Um, your teaching, you were telling me that you have a whole range of people that you work with, from high school to, uh, to um, graduate students. Right, well, in terms of research, our, our lab's got a, a real diversity in it. Um, there are a couple of high school students working on uh, science fair type of projects, and um, then there are 400 students, which means they're honor students in biology doing thesis research. And then there are uh, PhD students and master students. So it's mm -hmm. quite a range. They, they interact in interesting ways. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, your uh, research also takes you um, out into the uh, into the waterways here in the Great Lakes, and you have two mm -hmm. key projects that you have grants that you working mm -hmm. on. One is that is you're working on that purple flower that's taking over our marshlands mm -hmm. and, and uh, endangering the environment, the loose strife. Could you yes. tell us about that? Right. Well, actually, um, most of the research I'm involved in is joint work with John Lovett Das, my husband, who's also in biology. And we tend to have this sort of collective activity with uh, the kids, our children, um, the students in the lab, and so on, over the, especially in the summer. And one of the big projects we're working on is purple loosestrife. Um, from a sort of ecological viewpoint, we would like to see a solution for this weed that is ecologically sound, you know, not pouring herbicides into the mm -hmm. uh, freshwater system. It's so an invader, isn't it? It comes mm -hmm. from Europe? Yes, it, it arrived, everyone thinks, with the rocks and so on that used to be used for ballast for the sailing ships that came mm. across from Europe. And so when they checked all the, s the stones out uh, in the estuary of the St. Lawrence, they also threw out a lot of seeds. And so it first established in Quebec and, and gradually edged its way up through the water system of the Great Lakes. So it's hitting Ontario in a big way right now. Yeah, it's fighting, <coughs> uh, it's, it's fighting the cattails and others mm -hmm. for... Uh, right. In fact, our graduate student is, is working on the, the interaction between the purple loosestrife and the cattails and, and you know, watching them arm wrestle over time in, in the most gentle plant kind of way, you know, and uh, looking at, at how um, the balance of power between the two species could be changed. So mm -hmm. we're interested in manipulating the ecosystem, say, through nutrient changes or water changes to try and favor the locals over the invaders. Well, another area of your research with your husband, John Lovadoust, is in uh, the eelgrass, the grass mm -hmm. that's caught in propellers in, <laughs> in Lake St. Clair. And, that, and yeah. you have an interesting idea how that could be used. Well, uh, the way we're using it is kind of like the canary in a cage concept, where the plant is, is being taken to various places in the Great Lakes, and its growth in different places is being measured 
Um, and it's actually Machi Birnaki, one of our graduate students who's done a, a lot of the field work related to this. He's taken plants and put them in various places like uh, mm -hmm. the Shinali Cart, uh, Turkey Island, uh, and so on, and left them out there to see how they fare. So this is called biomonitoring, using an organism to monitor the environment. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's very interesting. It works very well because the, the big benefit is that uh, human beings can go out and sample water and measure the chemicals in it. But they don't tend to work, you know, 24-hour cycles, whereas the plant's sitting out there day and night and day and night forever, so it uh, measures exactly what it's been exposed to. Yeah, and you test those plants to see how much contamination uh, it's mm -hmm. absorbed, and it's really, right. a, a, like you say, the canary in the gold mine. Yeah, it's very helpful. the environment. Yes, actually, uh, Radhika Lazar, uh, who's a, a chemist in the Great Lakes Institute, is the person who does the actual measurements of mm -hmm. contaminants. And she, she is the most excellent uh, person at running a, a lab, a technical lab. And we should have her on 401 great. Sunset oh one yeah, day to talk great. about what she does. Before we finish, though, we want to talk about your appointment. Ruth mm -hmm. Greer, the Minister of Environment for Ontario, has appointed you to the Environmental Appeal Board. Mm -hmm. And that's a first for um, a, a professor. Mm -hmm. uh, tell us about that. Well, it was a, a real thrill to, to be appointed to this. The, for me, it's especially valuable because it bridges my scientific interests and my interest in environmental issues broadly. So it's a, an opportunity to be involved in uh, things that relate to environmental law and uh, mm -hmm. in seeing how judgments are made, being involved in judgments. Uh, this is a board that um, listens to someone who is unhappy with the, a decision of the environment ministry mm -hmm. and then they... Uh, you listen to their appeal and mm -hmm. make a written judgment to the to the Ontario Supreme Court. Yes, that's right. Mm -hmm. um, basically, um, if if an individual or a company or or something as an ent entity like that has a disagreement with a decision by the Ministry of the Environment, then they can appeal that decision and bring it before. Mm -hmm. Well, that board. appointment can take you all over the uh, <laughs> all over the province. Yes, it's yes. going to take much of your time. Um, it shouldn't be too demanding in terms of time. It's, uh, it's relatively a flexible situation, but mm -hmm. probably about 50 to 60 days cumulatively in the year. So well, a busy a person, uh, give it, if you want a job done right, give it to a busy person. <laughs> yes, they'll find time for yeah. something. Well, <laughs> thank you very much for being on 401 Sunset with us, Leslie. Thanks, John. My Thanks. guest today has been Leslie Lovett Doust, and now back to our host. Thanks, John. Well, tonight, we hope you've enjoyed watching the various people and organizations expressing themselves in and around our city. We hope you can join us here again every Tuesday and Thursday at 6 on Cable 11. Upcoming stories on 401 Sunset feature a profile of Dan Kelly, Lancer Hockey, and a probe of the university rankings in Maclean's magazine, and much, much more. Until then, I am Michelle Stonkis, and from all of the cast and crew at 401 Sunset, thank you for joining us and good night.